I don't think we need an emergency option. I think we can take the plunge and go for it and play knight takes e5. And the better calculator is going to win this game. There's This is going to get really exciting. Maybe it's losing for white. I don't know. But at this point, I think just out of principle, we need to take the plunge. I think we might need to give up a piece and hope for the best. Wow. I got thoroughly outcalculated here. I think what we need to do is cut our losses. Okay, Nikito 3001. I do want to play e4 in this game, even though we've been kind of toggling between the Jababa London uh, and 1e4. But let's resort back to our main repertoire, especially because we're facing the Karokan yet again. And anybody who has watched the speedrun for any length of time should know what move I wholeheartedly recommend against the Karokan. This, I think, is the best weapon for club players, for beginner to intermediate players by far. And that is, of course, the fantasy. It is the kryptonite of the majority of Karokan players. For two main reasons, it's less well-known than knight c3, e5, and e takes d5, the kind of mainline trifecta. So it's less studied. And two, it leads to extremely tactical positions. So black can't get away with just making Karokan moves and improvising. Okay, so pawn takes e4 and e5 is what everybody seems to be playing against us. This is the main line. And if you've watched the previous speedrun game, there was one a couple of games ago where we sacrificed our queen. It was an amazing game. And this exact line was featured in that game. So you should know that the move is not pawn takes e5, not because of the queen trade, although that's also fine for black, but of course, because of queen h4 check. And then the queen picks up the pawn on e4. Instead, we prioritize development. We bring our knight out to f3. Black plays bishop g4, which is the best move. The old line is e takes d4, which almost loses. I've analyzed that pretty extensively throughout the speedrun games. And on bishop g4, I've kind of advocated for two different lines. The line that I myself play with white is this move c3, solidifying the center, and then bringing the light squared bishop out to e2. But the move that I recommend to players in the sort of 1800 to 2000 range is the more ambitious, more popular move, which is bishop to c4, which really forces black to demonstrate very extensive theoretical knowledge in order to attain a good position and leads to countless tactical traps. Now, I don't know bishop c4 as well as c3, but again, for the purposes of the speedrun, I'm willing to put myself on the line and improvise if necessary. Let's bring the bishop out to c4. Now, we've already had a game where bishop takes f7 check was overlooked by our opponent. Of course, this guy clearly knows what he's doing. Knight to d7 is correct, and I've already explained previously why bishop takes f7 doesn't work here. So, you know, if you're watching on YouTube and you don't uh, remember the previous fantasy games, it might be worth pausing and you know, doing a quick run through of the previous fantasy games to acquaint yourself with the basic theory, because I'm not going to repeat, you know, the same basic observations. We're just going to go straight into the correct line of play, which is, of course, to castle kingside. And this is one of the biggest appeals of the fantasy. You get this semi open F file on which you can engineer a massive attack if black is not careful. Bishop takes F7, of course, is once again reinforced as a threat. Black plays knight, C knight F6. And now it's time for us to solidify our center because once black gets a couple of pieces out, pawn takes pawn is now a rather uh, nasty prospect, right? Our center is part of the reason, part of the appeal of the fantasy. So we need to take the sting out of the move e takes d4. Note that pawn takes e5 is not effective, not because of knight takes e5, that loses a piece, but rather because black can first take the knight on f3, then recapture on e5, and again, our center sort of evaporates. So once again, we need to play this move c3. And you might say, well, what about the knight on b1? Well, don't worry about the knight, because the knight can be brought out via d2 later on in the game. This knight is not essential to our general development and to the health of our position as things stand. But before bringing the knight out to d2, of course, it's always a good idea to bring your bishop out first. This is pretty standard fare. Uh, you don't want to block the development of one piece by bringing out another piece. So it's important for us to find suitable employment for our bishop. And there's really only one reasonable square. All of this has happened in previous speedrun games. We've followed this main line to, to the T, I think on more than one occasion. And around this point, I think, is where most players in the 
2000 chess.com range are out of theory, but I've been pretty surprised by the knowledge displayed by a couple of our opponents. H6. <clears throat> okay. And of course, we drop our bishop back to h4. We're trying to provoke the move g5, which our opponent plays. So now, of course, we drop our bishop back to g3. And again, you should remember that knight takes e4 is never a major problem because bishop takes f7 check always exists in response. This might be what we faced last time, but I don't really remember. Bishop g3, queen e7. Okay, so clearly our opponent knows absolutely everything here. So we're on our own. Let's think about this for a second. I think we might have faced this exact sequence before. I'm definitely out of theory, I will admit. We're on our own here. And it might very well be that we faced this exact sequence, and I just don't remember. But please forgive me, it is pretty late. And uh, my memory for openings is a lot worse than people realize. So clearly, first of all, clearly this guy did extremely serious work against the fantasy. Now... As I see it, the point of queen e7 is pretty clear. Black is solidifying his control over the e5 pawn and preparing to castle queenside, which is going to lead to a, an opposite side castling situation where both sides are going to use their pawns to attack the opposing side's king. So Black has this clear plan of h5, h4. We, on the other hand, have our own methods of approaching Black's king. We can play a4, a5, but we can also deploy our queen to b3 or even to a4 and try to harass and massage some of these weak pawns on the queen side. But all of that is beyond the scope of this position. First of all, we need to complete our development. We need to play knight bd2. And we need to wait for black to put his cards on the table. Okay, castle's queen side. Now, my worry is that if we start storming with our pawns, if we play a move like a4, we apply what I call the best case scenario test, where we say, okay, let's say our opponent allows us to do exactly what we want to do. How good is that going to be? Well, even if we get our pawn all the way up to a6, that's not as big of a deal as it may appear because black can just push the b pawn forward, like b5. We've wasted three tempi and all we've done is induce, you know, an unexploitable weakness on c6, which cannot be approached. So I think a4 is ineffective. I think we need to try to attack with our pieces. Well, what pieces can we recruit for the purpose of pressuring Black's queen side? There's also a weakness on f7, by the way, which you shouldn't forget about. Well, to me, the queen is the only piece that can be immediately recruited. We can play the move queen to a4, which is actually quite interesting. We can try to induce Black into playing king b8 and then drop our queen back to b3. And the appeal of forcing king b8 is that the queen on b3 would then be x-raying the b-pawn, which could add some spice to the position. You should also note that after queen a4, b5, which may scare some people off, is not a problem because we have queen to a6 check at a minimum in order to get the queen out of the tempo, and then we can move our bishop. So I like queen b3. I like queen a4. I think queen a4 is less likely to be considered by our opponent. So let's try to throw him off of uh, his theory with queen to a4. Now, if he knows this move, then I take my hat off. Absolutely. But very often, what you see when players are incredibly well-prepared and armed to the teeth, that can actually backfire. Because sometimes when the analysis cuts off abruptly and you're suddenly posed with a decision of your own, it, you know that situation is very dangerous. The move right after you exit your prep is extremely notorious for being, you know, the site of a lot of immediate mistakes. And probably you can kind of relate to that, you know, and remember a game where you were super well prepared and super excited. Then your opponent plays a movie you didn't consider. You're mad at yourself for not considering it because it's actually pretty reasonable. And, you know, as a result, you panic and make a mistake. So knight to b6 here is not an issue. That is why we put the knight on d2. The bishop is buttressed by the knight. So knight b6, we play queen takes a7 simply. That's a blunder. Knight takes bishop, knight takes knight. And if our knight gets to c4, that there will be hell to pay for black because the b6 square could be used as an attacking post for the knight. So I'm anticipating king to b8, but it's a good sign that our opponent is actually thinking. And the other way to defend, of course, is a6. But a6 would be absolute music to my ears. In fact, if you watched my Blitz games or my speedrun for any length of time, you should know what move 
I'm itching to make in the event of a6. That, of course, is bishop to a6, which is not even really a sacrifice, if you think about it. Because how many pawns are you getting for the piece? Well, you're getting one. Then you're going to grab the pawn on c6 with check, because remember, the b-pawn is going to have to take the bishop. And if you want, you could even take a third pawn on a6, which probably we don't want. Probably what we would do there is bring the knight into the attack with knight to c4. a6 would be amazing for us. Let's see what our opponent comes up with. He's now invested two minutes into this position. I suppose bishop d6 can drop back to b8. But already there are some Bowden's mate type ideas. Okay, king b8, let's drop the queen back to b3. That's kind of what we decided. So let's not uh, tarry any further and just drop the queen back. Because already here, already here, b5 had become a slightly bigger problem. Although I guess we still would have had queen b3. But the queen on a4 has overstayed its welcome. The only point of this move is to get this king to drag it onto b8. Now, there might be some cognitive dissonance because you might have heard me share this advice that when you castle queenside, often tucking the king away on b8 is a good thing, right? It's safer on b8 or b1 than it is on c8 or c1. But this is an exception to the rule because we've got this queen and because we've got this x-ray, we're basically trying to gain tempi. And here, a4, a5, a6 is a little bit more effective because the king is kind of in the crosshairs of the queen. Now, hopefully that kind of makes sense. Now, I'm not really doing too much calculation. I'm just trying to cause some practical problems for our opponent to pose some dilemmas and that's what leads to mistakes now also bishop a6 of course is a very serious idea here now bishop a6 may may strike you as just a, a an empty one move threat but it's not because if we can force black to play b6 well that's a very serious weakening of the queen side and this is technically the queen side even though black's king is located there but geographically, it's still, still the queen side. So once the bishop vacates the c4 square, the knight can also jump into c4. And once that happens, the pressure on the e5 pawn grows very powerful. So let's not short-sightedly, you know, section the board off and assume that we're just operating on these three files. We're also operating in the center. Now we've got three attackers on the e5 pawn. And we're attacking the f7 pawn, which absolutely we might want to take in the absence of a better move. I think we've succeeded in, in posing practical problems to black. Yeah, and that's the thing. If we are able to play bishop a6 and black covers with the knight, then d takes e5, as things stand currently, would simply win the game. Because it would fork the bishop and the knight. I suppose black would have bishop c5 check. But even after king h1, that bishop will x-ray the king. Another good reason to drag black's king to b8. The fact that the bishop on g3 x-rays the black king doesn't seem important now, but if the bishop ever leaves d6, it absolutely will become important. Quick shout out to people watching on YouTube. Thank you for all of the kind words and all of the subscriptions. Knight to h5. Yeah, that's what I was a little bit worried about, but then I actually think upon closer inspection, this might be a mistake. Not to get people's hopes up. So what is the purpose of knight h5? Well, the purpose is very clear. Black is trying to eliminate the dark squared bishop in order to relieve the pressure on the e5 pawn. So obviously bishop takes f7 is possible. But what strikes, it, it move strikes me as very awkward and not a good use of our time. Because after the trade on g3, black can start running that h pawn down the board. And those doubled g pawns will serve as what's called hooks. Right, And a hook in attacking terminology is when you advance a pawn and you kind of use an opponent's pawn as gunpowder to, to blast open the king's side. And that bishop on f7 is going to have to be evacuated if we are to operate on the queen's side. So we're going to have to waste another tempo on bishop c4. And the open f file might actually favor black if we ever need to make a mad dash for the center of the board. I don't like bishop f7. I think we should stick to our guns here. What does it mean to stick to our guns? Well, we need to generate threats against Black's king. Well, we already know the best way to do that. I think the best way to do that is, well, let me think about this. I think it probably is bishop a6, although upon closer examination, bishop a6, knight b6. Oh, and there we've got knight takes c5. I think this might be working out for us. I think we should go bishop a6. 
this creates a host of problems for black. If we can get black to play b6, we've already discussed that that favors white, and we can follow up with knight to c4, creating serious problems for black's king. Now, from c4, the knight could potentially even jump into a5. Again, reaping the benefits of this x-ray is one of the themes of our attack. If black plays knight to b6, then we need to be very careful. If black plays knight to b6, then we need to be careful. We need to start calculating concretely. Now, what do we do in response to knight to b6? Well, after knight b6, the bishop hangs. So we need to play with tempo. So knight takes e5 comes to mind. How do I see this move? Well, once the knight moves away from d7, you should realize that black relinquishes their control over e5. So knight to b6, knight takes e5. At that point, black can't take the bishop because the knight dives into c6 with a fork on the king and the queen. So after knight b6, knight takes e5. If black plays bishop takes e5, we recapture with the bishop and we're chilling because that's also a check and it hits the rook in the corner. That's out of the question. The more concerning line is knight takes e5, knight takes g3. Knight takes g3 first. Because there, if we simply recapture on g3, which actually might be the best move, I don't know. We'll, we'll cross that bridge if we get there. Black will then be able to play bishop takes e5. And perhaps it's hard for you to visualize this line. But the bottom line is when all of the smoke clears, that bishop on a6 is going to be hanging. Right? If the knight on e5 is eliminated and the bishop on g3 is eliminated, all that we would have left is this knight on d2. And we wouldn't have that knight on e5 that, that defends indirectly against b takes a6, if that makes sense. Again, don't worry about visualizing this. I'll show all of this after, after the game as well. And our opponent, of course, goes for knight b6. Really no other choice for black, I think. Let's think about this for a moment. Okay, I think we should take the plunge. Now, there is an alternative to playing knight takes pawn. And the alternative to playing knight takes pawn is, of course, to take the pawn with the bishop. If we take the pawn of the bishop, my issue is that black can play b8. We take the rook, black takes on h8, and black has two minor pieces for a rook, which normally in these sharp middle games favor the side with the minor pieces because minor pieces just are, are more effective attackers when there are closed files. So that would be an emergency option. I don't think we need an emergency option. I think we can take the plunge and go for it and play knight takes e5, and the better calculator is going to win this game. There's This is going to get really exciting. Maybe it's losing for white. I don't know. But at this point, I think just out of principle, we need to take the plunge. We need to take the plunge here. There are some... Okay, bishop e6. Well, that's kind of a cop-out move. And there was one crazy tactic that worried me. This was not it, although now I see that I blundered it. Or at least I underestimated this, I think. I guess I seriously underestimated this move. Wait, let's think about this. Let me focus in silence for a moment because there's a lot to think about here and we're in, we're in danger. Somehow I, I saw this move, but I didn't realize it was actually a big problem. But now I see that it is. Man, last few speedrun games have been difficult. I think we might need to give up a piece and hope for the best. Wow. I got thoroughly outcalculated here. I think what we need to do is cut our losses. And the reason we need to cut our losses is because I forgot that... I thought we could just move our queen back, to be completely honest. I thought we could move our queen back, and black still can't take the bishop. But again, I forgot that black can first take this other bishop, then take the knight, and then take the bishop on a6 in that order. Now, bishop c4 comes to mind, but the problem there is that black still takes the bishop, then black takes the knight on e5, and suddenly the knight on d2 hangs is the rook is x-raying the knight. The rook is x-raying the knight. So what we need to do is give up a piece, but extract the maximum material out of it. We're going to lose one of these pieces. So how do we gracefully give a piece up in order to extract the maximum concessions from black? Well, the only way to do this in the interest of time is actually knight takes c6 check. Without this resource, I think we're dead on the spot. With this resource, I think we have pretty decent practical chances. I don't know what our opponent is thinking about here because BC is absolutely forced, but maybe this has come as a surprise to him. Okay, so after BC, we play bishop takes d6 check. 
And I will admit I messed up. We're probably objectively not lost. I would not say that white is lost here. White is worse. But practically, we have very serious compensation. In what form? Well, first of all, we have two pawns. So it's not like we're down a full piece for nothing. And of course, we have long-term chances against Black's King, which, you know, we'll basically need to play perfectly the rest of this game to avoid losing it. I got out -calcul out prepared and then out-calculated completely. So kudos. But let's see how our opponent plays the technical phase of the game. All right. So we need to move our queen back. We can move it back to d1 to hit the knight. But th the knight wants to go to f4 anyway. I think it's a better use of our queen to stick it on c2. Because it's just a little bit more out of the way. And it leaves the rooks more coordinated. So I like this more than queen d1, even though that move occurs with tempo. And one hack for trying to climb out of these difficult positions is you want to give your opponent as much rope as possible. You want to give black as many decisions as possible for two reasons. Of course, the time situation, right? Seven and a half minutes isn't a lot of time. And second of all, the more decisions your opponent has to make, the more nervous they're going to get. So these more open-ended moves can actually be a very powerful defensive tool rather than just automatically going for the forcing lines. Now we need to press on the gas. We have to find a way to expose Black's King. And the only vehicle toward exposing Black's King is to get rid of the B6 Knight. And the only way to do that is to run this A pawn down the board. So we'll start with the move A4 and we'll hope for the best. Yeah, we'll start with A4, A5. Unfortunately, we can never play Queen B3, Queen B7 because of this darn Bishop on E6. But tactically, we could potentially shut the Bishop out with a well-timed D5. So keep that in mind. Keep in mind that d5, and I would play king a8 here with black, but you know all of this is not trivial at all for a 2,000 player. So we're just going to keep peppering black with decisions and dilemmas, and hopefully, eventually, he cracks. Although it might take a, a long while. Yeah, it's actually not trivial at all here, because in a weird kind of way, our king is pretty safe for the time being. It's going to take a while for Black to coordinate his pieces enough to get to our king. You should also note that if Black ever plays g4, that would be a major blunder because of e5 slicing off the connection between the queen and the knight. So g4, g3 is hard to engineer as well. And without that, our king is perfectly safe for the time being. Yeah, White's knight has, you know, c5 as an outpost. Of course, we would have to go through bishop takes b3 and weigh the pros and cons of that trade. And on that topic, when you're down a piece, let's say for two pawns, you absolutely should not rule out trades just in general. Trades can actually be good when done strategically. Of course, a queen trade would be a pretty, pretty disastrous here for white. But, you know, a minor piece trade could be okay. King a8, okay. I think that we need to spice things up a little bit more on the queen side. Now, if we rush with a5, if we rush with a5, the problem is that after black drops the knight back to d7, black will have this very nasty threat of c5, which can be a little bit hard to visualize, but what that does is opens up an attack on the bishop on a6 a a and forces it away, whereas we want to keep that bishop on a6 as long as possible. So I think what we should try to do is delay the move a5 until we're ready to play it, and instead, I think that we should continue kind of activating and spicing things up on the queen side by grabbing more space with b4. This also prevents black from playing c5. And again, I'm trying to give black as much rope as possible. A lot of people here would be tempted to play g4. That's an understandable move. You know, let's start attacking. I think the better move would be h5. But again, an advanced decision that has to be made by black. And he's really starting to run low on time. And I know that you know, using our opponent's clock isn't really in the, in the spirit of the speedrun, but at this level, I'm trying to give you a realistic portrayal of exactly how, I'm, how I would play, how I would treat this. And no matter what time control you play, most people watching this aren't going to be playing a time control over 15 plus 10. So hopefully that advice about milking your opponent's clock isn't entirely cheap. I wouldn't say this is bad for Black, but in a weird way, it's very, very hard to play. It's hard for black to find a way to make progress. You just almost don't feel the extra piece. I think if I had to assess the engine evaluation here, I would guess something like minus one 
or minus 1.5, which is a lot. Black is clearly better, but I wouldn't say it's more than minus two. It, you know, it's, it's practically very difficult. And our opponent is spending over a minute a move, which is really, really good for us. Now, it's not so easy for white to make progress on the queen side either. Obviously, after we play a5 and we knock the knight away, let's say back to d7, well, what are we going to do after that? Well, of course, there's a possibility of us going b5, but let's put all that aside because bishop c8 is a big decision. Bishop c8 is a big decision. And we have a very interesting tactical idea here that has to be properly fleshed out. So let me try to calculate it. Oh, it's really cool. We have a very cool move here. And again, this move, if calculated correctly, is sexy. If not, well, then it's a very bad move because we can simply play bishop takes c8 and then a5. But, he, but we can also play a5 right away. And after bishop takes bishop, a takes b6, bishop takes f1, rook takes a7 check, and then the queen joins into the attack via a4, setting up mating patterns along the lines of rook a8 and queen a7. I think that works out. I think that we should start with a5. Again, forcing our opponent to calculate, to honor this and calculate bishop a6. Now, the practical player might just trust white and say, okay, I trust you. I'm going to go knight d7 quickly. But most, again, you know, that takes a lot of experience. It's also easy to just fall into the rabbit hole and start calculating. And then you look up and you have one minute. Okay, so, so notice really what I'm trying to do here. Posing problems on every single move. And imperceptibly, Black's clock is starting to dwindle. The additional benefit of this move is that had we immediately taken on c8, Black would have had the extra possibility of knight takes c8. Whereas now the knight doesn't have c8 and it has to drop back to d7. Then we can play bishop takes c8. Or we could even play knight to c4 with tempo. And we're starting to really accumulate those pieces on the queen side. So notice what's happening to Black's clock. Another minute is being spent. Not to get too obsessed with Black's clock, but it's kind of fun to watch it tick down. Because you start feeling that you start feeling the nerves from your opponent. And that's always a good feeling. And I also see a really, really cool tactic, which hopefully we'll have a chance to implement. Okay. Less than three minutes now for our opponent. And he doesn't budge. Knight d7. Okay. Now I think that we should play knight to c4. And again, we can delay bishop takes c8 by a move because we know that we're going to play knight to c4 anyway, right? That's a move that should be completely obvious to you because it brings the knight into attacking uh, position. But there's also a hidden tactic that I think we might get a chance to implement if our opponent reacts incorrectly. So let's tease black with another dilemma, one after the other after the other. Every move is another dilemma that we're forcing black into. And hopefully if he takes another minute, you know, then he's going to be under two minutes. Now. Here, we're forcing Black to decide where he wants to put his queen. So let's see what our opponent decides. No, but I have to give tremendous credit to our opponent for just tremendous play so far. But we've obviously made huge strides ever since giving the piece away. And he finds queen c7. Okay, I was really hoping for queen to e6. No such luck. Now we have no choice. You don't want to overdo this. So sometimes if your move is forced, then your move is forced. We have no choice. We have to play bishop takes c8. Maybe b5 merited a little bit more consideration there, but I don't think so. All right. Now we cannot rest on our laurels. We have to keep the foot on the gas pedal, so to speak. We have to keep making progress and posing black with newer and newer problems in order to keep the momentum of the game going because we are down a piece. Now, we should remember that that does not mean tunnel visioning the queen side. This is what I've been saying at the start. You have to look at all sides of the board. And if you look at the king side, you might say, well, wait a second. I'm looking at this f7 pawn. I'm looking at this knight and I'm looking at my rook and I'm saying, why can't I simply play g3, force the knight out of f4 and take another freaking pawn on f7? And once that pawn is captured, the e4 pawn becomes a passer, which basically means that all end games are going to be good for white as well. So g3, why would this be a counterintuitive move for some people. Well, it weakens the king a little bit, but with the reduced material on the board and the lack of a light squared bishop, we're really not paying the price for this move that we otherwise would have. And 
the pawn in f7 is is just juicy af also once we take f7 we develop massive tactical potential along the seventh rank one thing that you should absolutely see if you're tactically sharp is the presence of knight to b6 check which could be okay obviously king g2 and now rook takes f7 we can make these two moves very quickly and wait a second there might be a game winning tactic here and this is beautiful this is beautiful so how do i see this well there's a couple of elements here well there's the pin along the seventh rank and then there is the x-ray along the a file and these two things combined should lead you to the move knight to b6 check now it's not hard to calculate this if knight takes b6 then we take on c7 and you might say well what about rook f2 check there well rook f2 check you can always play queen takes f2 and give the queen up for a rook and a piece after knight b6 check, a, b, a, b is a discovered check that wins the queen on c7 and the game. And on that note, we can simply drive the knight into b6. Yeah, really, really pretty. Because this uses multiple tactical features to make it work. If the, our rook had not been on f7, then black would be able to keep the a file closed with knight takes b6. Right? a, b, queen takes b6, big deal. So now we use both of our rooks in order to indirectly support the knight. There's a beautiful follow-up. I'm I don't think this is going to happen, but black can also play the move queen takes b6 and try to basically give the queen up for a maximum amount of material. Of course, queen takes b6, we can play rook takes f8 check first. All right, very important intermediate move so that the rook doesn't hang, but I also see an incredible idea now, I don't know if we should play this because this is not in the spirit of the speedrun to play only for beauty. The business move is rook takes f8 check and then a takes b6 and we're completely winning. But there is also a really, really pretty line that goes a, b, rook takes f7, rook takes a7, king to b8. And in that position, there is a game-winning tactic that's really gorgeous. But... Again, I don't want to do this because our goal is to play objectively. I will show you after the game. But what is the purpose of the speedrun? It's to play accurate chess. And accurate chess dictates that you should simply take on f8 and take on b6. As much as I would love to do it. Okay, so obviously here we play queen f2. And the simplest is just rook takes a7 check, a little intermediate move. And we win absolutely everything. You can choose which knight to take. Uh, rook takes d7. Of course, black will play knight takes e4. So I think... The simplest is king takes f2, and then swing the rook over to the other side of the board and start chomping off uh, all of black's pawns on the king side. It's all over. So our attack has succeeded. What a game. That was fun. And there's a good theoretical component here, because I've struggled in this fantasy line on several occasions now. Maybe queen a4, queen b3 is the top move. I Because I remembered this idea of queen a4. I remembered it from our earlier fantasy game i just didn't remember the exact context okay so let's analyze thankfully we didn't get disconnected so again in earlier fantasy games i gave you the sort of overview of other lines here because we're at a higher level we're going to focus directly on the line that our opponent played so bishop c4 again c3 is an alternative uh to remember so the one thing i will say is that knight f6 is a very common mistake here bishop takes f7 and knight takes e5 uh, wins the game because the knight comes back and takes the bishop. So knight d7, castles, knight f6, and c3. Solidifying the center. Yeah, bishop d6, bishop g5, uh, still main line. And now h6 is actually not that common. Bishop h4, g5. Yeah, this is what we faced. I think this is exactly what we faced in an earlier fantasy game. And I don't remember exactly how that game went, but I'm I'm seeing this game Sichev against Svane. And for some reason, I remember citing that game earlier. So maybe this is some recommendation in a chessable course or in some article that's going around because now two people have played this exact thing. Yeah, so I remembered correctly. I remember that queen a4 was an engine idea here. Queen a4, queen b3. And for some reason, you know, maybe it wasn't exactly here, but that's what influenced my decision. So queen a4 is not a good move, though. I did confuse something. It's not a great move, although black has to be ultra precise. So I actually don't think queen a4 is a bad idea. According to the engine in this position, 
White is not better here. So clearly this is some recommendation. I don't know who came up with this. Oh, it's in the Lamy course. It's a, apparently it's in the Irwin Lamy chessable course on the Karokan. That would make perfect sense. So apparently Queen C2 is the top engine move, which is a modest move with the aim of solidifying the E4 pawn. But if you have to play that, then it's pretty meh. Also interesting is the immediate Queen B3, according to the computer. And now if Black plays Bishop takes F3, which is the top engine move, Rook takes F3 is the line. E takes D4. C takes D4. Looks scary for Black, but apparently this works out quite nicely for Black. Rook takes F3. E takes D4. C takes D4. Bishop G3, HG. And Black actually gets away with the move Knight takes E4, as crazy as it seems. Because after Rook takes F7, Black takes on D2 and hits the Queen. And the liquidation leads to an equal endgame. I mean, I... If I was judging this visually, I would take white. But the engine actually prefers black by a tiny margin after rook h8. So it's a draw. This is an equal endgame. It can be played by both sides. So that's an interesting line. Now, after queen b3, if black does not know bishop takes f3, which to me is far from intuitive, I, to me, like knight h5 would be the intuitive move. But knight h5 loses to knight takes e5. Oh, my gosh. Oh, this is beautiful. And if black plays, knight takes g3. Okay, this is incredible on so many levels. So what is white's best move here? Now, obviously, it's not hg because then black just takes on e5. The intuitive move is rook takes f7, but rook takes f7 loses to a beautiful counter tactic. Can anybody find it? Black to play. The fun begins. Why not rook takes f7? So what you should notice here is that the knight on g3 restricts the king. The king does not have these two escape squares. So in your mind, you should be generating a tactical pattern where if this bishop lands on this diagonal, it's basically checkmate. The move is queen takes d5, and this actually was a thing in the game as well. De bishop c5 is not made. It's not made because white can drop the rook back to f2, but it's quite clear at this point the black's attack is completely insurmountable. Black is going to get a ton of material for the queen. You can stave off checkmate with h takes g3 and just moving the king away, but black picks up the knight, and now black has a rook and two minors for the queen, as well as a raging attack. It's winning for black, according to the engine. Incredible idea. An incredible preparation, Nikito. Uh, good job learning the course. The move here is knight takes c6 out of nowhere. And this is a different mating pattern. This one, white mates black's king with bishop a6 and... and uh, Queen b7. Now, hopefully you were able to see this move. Knight c6 ends the game, but in the other way. Now, notice that here, knight e2 check doesn't do anything because black white can just play bishop takes e2. And after queen e8, the simplest is just to recapture the knight. Simplest is to recapture the knight. There are some more tactics here, but basically white wins. So I don't know if Lamy considers queen b3, but I think queen b3 might be the most testing move. Now, I think some people would probably play rook h to f8 here, which is actually not a bad move. This is the engine's second suggestion. And here, according to the engine, white should simply bring the rook over to e1 and really solidify that e4 pawn. And after knight h5, bishop drops back, the knight dives into f4. The position is complicated. I mean, it's equal and playable for both sides. Apparently, the best thing to do here is to tuck the king away to relative safety on h1. Black starts attacking with h5. And white starts attacking with a four. And we get just, you know, fascinating Karokan fantasy play. Uh, also interesting is to play d5 here for white. d5, open up the bishop's diagonal and, and attack on a7. Of course, black can play c5 and keep things closed, but that gives white another major asset in the form of a protected passer, albeit a blockaded one. Albeit a blockaded one, but still. This would be a great position to analyze. According to the engine, bishop to b5 here, followed by knight to c4. I like white's position here. I would play this. So I think for the next time we face this, queen b3 would be a very, very testing line. Bishop takes f3 here is you have to know that move because it's not intuitive to me at all. Now, we decided to start with queen a4, which uh, in retrospect is probably wrong. And after king to b8, then we drop the queen back to b3. And apparently here... 
Bishop takes f3 again is the best move. Now let's compare and contrast. We had this exact position with the king on c8. What difference does the king being on b8 make? Well, we go down the exact same line. Bang, 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 bang. Ah, wait a second. Uh-huh. Rook take knight takes c4, rook takes f7, knight d2, rook e7, knight b3, knight d2, rook e7, knight b3, bishop takes b3. And the key difference is that here, in contrast, the king on b8 is simply a safer piece. White does not have this additional check on e6, which is a great asset if the king is on c8. So black is attacking d4. Black is slightly better here because white is having a hard time defending the d4 pawn. If white goes rook t1, black can smoke the rook out of e7 with rook h8. And black is better. White is just saddled with these weaknesses. So apparently the presence of the king on b8 versus c8 just benefits black in this exact version of events. But to me, knight h5 is a very human move because this is the main idea of black's queenside setup. And this loses. Let's see. And I, oh, and I miss knight takes e5. Knight takes e5 is winning. For some reason, I didn't consider knight takes e5. This is tunnel vision. This is a great example of tunnel vision occurring at, you know, the GM level. Because what happened is I associated this idea with bishop a6, right? I kind of associated it with bishop a6. And so I didn't take other ideas seriously. And I didn't realize that after knight takes e5, we're threatening knight takes c6 check. So conceptually, I had the right thought, but I didn't consider this at all. Now, what about knight takes e5? Well, here we play bishop takes e5. Bishop takes e5, rook takes f7, the game is over. Black loses his queen because the queen can't move, but black gets checkmated. So of course, in this position, black has to play this miserable move and go a pawn down. But not only is it a pawn down, white is also the attack rages on with e5. And then knight e4 and rook a e1, it's completely winning. Unacceptable unacceptable miss and i just rushed it bishop a6 well we took over a minute but i had made up my mind a lot earlier so a good example of not kind of limiting your thinking by telling yourself i'm making this move in order to make this other move right you have to be more open-minded than that and i think this is an instructive example now bishop takes e5 of course you play rook takes f7 immediately here and you win the game um, not bishop takes e5 check because of knight takes e5 and now you've lost your opportunity to take on f7 because the knight defends the pawn. So move order is important here. You have to choose the right moment to take on f7. Hopefully that makes sense. So knight h5 should have been a decisive mistake. The correct move for black here was bishop takes f3. Probably also king to a8 is a very reasonable move. This is a more prophylactic approach that kind of keeps the, the spice of the game alive. And this would resemble the position that we were analyzing just earlier uh, with the king still on c8. Yeah, no, uh, rookie mistake. I played bishop a6. And now the tables turn completely. After knight to b6, I'm pretty sure the black is already... Let's see. No, maybe not better. I'll check with the engine real quick. Bishop a6. Knight to b6. No, white is still better. But I made another mistake. White is still better, but I made another mistake. Tunnel vision. I was so enamored with this idea of, ooh, let's induce knight b6 and play knight e5 that I just didn't see the forest for the trees. And of course, I miss bishop e6, which is the only move that gives black an advantage. The correct move is indeed bishop takes e5. And I misevaluated this as well. White is better here. Ba? Oh my gosh. But here, okay. Here you have to find a crazy computer move. Bishop h8, rook h8 is about equal, which is what I would assume but here white has a ridiculous engine move that just okay it makes some sense but not when there is a hanging rook let's see who can find this move you just have to attack like you just have to attack the king now you might say it's c4 well it's not c4 but it's the right square it's the wrong piece the reason it's not c4 is because of again bishop e6 pinning the pawn and the queen has no squares along the b file such that you know or period so white has a hard time getting c5 in. The correct move is actually knight to c4. And you might say, well, isn't bishop e6 even stronger because it pins the bishop? Well, of course, there are tactics as usual. There's knight takes d6. After bishop takes b3, the knight steps back with a discovery. Black can give the queen away for a piece. But now the knight dives in. And now white can win more material with knight c6 and knight takes d8. Obviously, with three pawns and a rook for the two minors, 
and the queens off the board white is much better. And then you could follow up with the prophylactic g3 to restrict the mobility of black's knight. So very, very cool stuff here. Now after knight c4, black is in trouble. Because knight takes b6, knight takes d6, all of it is a threat. If you play bishop takes e5, well, that loses to knight takes e5. It's about plus over minus. Apparently, black has to find this move. And here, you trade everything on d6. And again, using the pawn as a hook in order to open the f file and generate a very nice post for the knight. White is better. White is a big initiative here. So in fact, bishop a6 was not so bad if it was... Uh, precipitated by the right sequence. Of course, I was just blindly going for this line. And uh, this came as a ma major, major cold shower. This came as a major, major cold shower. But as I just checked, it does not win the game. Black is only slightly better after we give away our piece. Only slightly better, believe it or not. So this is the attacking potential of our pieces. Even after we give up a piece, we're still slightly better. What was I expecting here? Well, of course, I was expecting this particular line, although now it occurs to me that black can still play queen takes e5. And this just leads to wild complications. You cannot play de, because after bishop c5, rook f2, again, there's rook takes d2, similar to what we looked at earlier. But there is the move knight to c4, adding another attacker to the queen. Now the queen is attacked from two different sources. Black can't take on c4 because of checkmate. And the situation just becomes total tactical pandemonium. Rook takes b7, of course, is also a massive threat. Black has to play this move, king f2, and apparently black has to find queen f4 check, giving away the queen. Black now has a rook and two minors for the queen, but white still has a pretty strong attack on the queen side. Engine gives a slight edge for white. Just insane. And the reason you have to play queen f4 check is if you just move the queen anywhere... First of all, the queen doesn't have a lot of squares. I guess this is one of the only squares. Here, there is forced checkmate. Let's see who can find it. White to play and mate the fastest. You have a beautiful move, queen takes b6, which does result in checkmate, but it's not the fastest. This is not the fastest. Thank you, yada yada, man. What's the, what's the move here? This is easy. You should pause on YouTube and figure this out. Good little mate practice. Yeah, rook takes a7, simply removing the defender. And then queen b6, queen b7 checkmate. So, yeah. So after king f2, the threat is rook takes b7 and rook takes a7. That's actually why you put the knight on c4. Also to attack the queen. So you have to forcibly remove the rook from f7. Alternatively, you can also play queen e7. Same type of concept to force the rook off the board and get a bunch of material for the queen. So as crazy as this line is, you should understand the, the sort of logic behind white's play. Why not to start with rook takes b7 and then to play knight c4? Well, the reason is that with the rook no longer on f7, after knight e2 check, and by the way, obviously you can't go king h1 because you get mated, so you have to take the plunge. Here, black has queen f4 check, and the rook isn't guarding that square. And this gives black a tempo that black can use to draw the bishop back to c7 and guard the knight, thereby taking the sting out of this particular mating sequence. Yeah, bishop c7 is another difficult move, but if you know the threat, you have a chance of finding it. Of course, knight c4, there's still rook a7, and queen b7 mates. Just the incredible lines. So, yeah, so all of this aside, bishop b6 circumvents all of these issues. Of course, if white plays bishop back to c4, which I think a lot of people were lobbying for, the problem is knight g3, hg, and bishop e5. Very, very easy to forget about this. The knight is x-rayed by the rook because it's just not a tactical feature that seems pertinent, and yet it is. And as I was saying earlier, if queen c2, then the problem isn't the x-ray because here the knight on d2 is protected. It's the fact that, well, the bishop on a6 is just hanging. But why wasn't it hanging earlier? Well, it's because of knight takes c6 check. And why... Does black need to take on g3 first? Well, because if black takes on e5 first, white, of course, can recapture with the bishop. So everything should make sense here. It's just about putting the puzzle pieces together. You eliminate the bishop, you eliminate the knight, and then the other bishop can be captured. So for that reason, we have to make a graceful... We have to hit the eject button. 
right? That's what I would compare this to. You know that you're losing a piece here. What is the best way of generating the maximum amount of material for that piece? This is an area where a lot of players struggle. When they encounter a situation like this, they completely panic, right? And just like give away a piece or give away sometimes two pieces. So the point is, you know that you're losing the bishop in most lines. So instead of losing the bishop, we actually give up the knight now we know that the bishop is going to be left intact and we get, gain a second pawn and we generate long-term chances against black's king. So we have to trade and we drop the queen back to c2 and we kind of reset. Now I think knight f4 is a great move. We start attacking with a4. And here I think our opponent missed a major opportunity to solve the problems on the queen side. I think king a8, as natural as it is, once b4 is played, we have now deprived Black of the opportunity to play c5, which is a move that I had mentioned earlier. I think Black should have played c5 here. I think Black should have played c5 here. And after White plays d5, there is a hard-to-spot idea. Now, I've mentioned many times that when you are up material, one of the most common technique involves sacrificing some of that material back in order to change the character of your advantage. This is a great example of that. You play knight bd5. Now you might say, well, wait a second, this is checkmate. It's not because black can just drop back to b6 and block the check. After e takes d5, the point is not that you take the bishop because then white takes black's bishop. It's the simple bishop takes d5. Now what's going on here? Well, the bishop on a6 is hanging, as is the g2 pawn. And if that pawn is captured, all hell will break loose on the king side. So for example, if white drops the bishop back, after bishop takes g2, clearly the situation for white is dire. And if white lifts the rook up, then probably even knight h3 check is, is winning the game because knight takes f2 and the knight on d2 hangs. But it's not the best according to the engine. The best according to the engine is queen c6 setting up knight h3 checkmate. So remember that and keep it in the back of your head. I think c5 would have given black a nearly decisive advantage. According to the computer, white can keep the tension with knight to f3. It's about minus 1.5. Black plays cd uh, and uh, cd. And if black plays g4, apparently knight e1 and white is somehow all right. Because in this position, the knight on f4 has lost the support of the pawn and white has like a5 coming. So this is still very, very sharp. No question about it. But uh, black is on the road to solving a lot of problems. Knight back to d7 is a good move to force this bishop off of a6. So hopefully this makes sense. It's not that after king a b4, black isn't better. I think black is still better, but the situation is starting to deteriorate here. So bishop c8, we play a5. And of course, the tactical justification, which had to be very carefully calculated, is this line. Rook a7 check, king b8, and now a very instructive moment you might be attracted to this tactical pattern. And you might say, ah, well, after queen a4 check, white is winning, and white is winning. Not with checkmate on c7, but actually with b7 and b8, queen or bishop, and white makes a second queen and is winning. The problem, though, is that black is not obliged to take the rook. Remember this, because you just have to always keep it in your mind that, yeah, your opponent can decline your sacrifices. So instead of trying to go for the beauty prize, the simple queen a4 ends the game. And in such situations, it's always a good idea to take a look at your own king in order to tease out whether you have the time to make a quiet move like queen to a4. And here the answer is yes. How do I know that? Well, it's clear if you look at white's king, the black has no way to whip up any meaningful attack against our king. You have to check this move, but you can just play king takes f1. And then you can play king takes e2, and clearly white's king escapes the checks. Even king f2 is winning here. And you can sidestep black's minor pieces and go to e1. And there is just no stopping rook a8 and queen a7. And it's just mate. Whatever black does, I mean, bishop b5 is just checkmate. Now, if black tries to run away with king to c8, well, then you actually play king takes f1 to open up the path for queen a6, queen b7. Very nice move, by the way, right? You want to go queen a6. What's stopping you? It's the bishop. Get rid of the bishop. Incredible. The usage of white's king and contributing to the attacking, to the attack. So that was what I was hoping for. Our opponent, very alertly, drops the knight back. But once we get the knight in, once we get the knight in, and actually, 
Uh, I also wanted to show what happens after queen to e6, which in retrospect might have been black's best move. Does anybody know what my idea was here for white? This is a little bit speculative, but in, in practice, this is very hard to refute. And it's the similar thing that we did in the game. It's just a little bit more involved in this case. It's what, what tactical move? Just blast open the file. Knight b6, yeah, you sacrifice the knight. In order, in order to do what? In order to open the A file. And we already know how dangerous this is. We're down two knights, but it doesn't matter. Now we're threatening all sorts of discoveries. So black's hand is essentially forced. But after rook takes A6, according to the engine, what I missed is that after king to B8, black is surviving and the position remains complicated. Most humans, I think, would take on A6. And the chief difference is that now there is this rook A8 check move. Here, this is even cleaner because you simply go around and checkmate the king on c7. Remember, the difference is here the queen is on e6. There, it was on d6. Now, king b7, we bring the rook back to a7. What was the purpose of white's last two moves? Well, where did the rook come from? It came from a6, and it ends up on a7. Why did we need to remove it from a6? Well, we know what piece wants to occupy the a6 square. It is white's queen, so queen a4 is winning the game because, again, we're already familiar with all of the mating patterns here. Knight takes b6, queen a6, there's no stopping checkmate. You don't even need the pawn anymore because you have too many avenues in too many mating patterns. Knight e2 check, remember, always just sidestep. Don't pay attention to moves like this. As long as you make sure that your king is safe, you're fine. So this was my idea. Our opponent understandably refrained from it. And after g3, already white is better, no question about it. White is already better. Now, I think knight h3 in g4 is correct, because black saves the tempo. But after rook takes f7, of course, our opponent makes the decisive mistake and allows knight b6 check. What did black have to do in this position? After which the position remains very complicated. It, as sad as it is to make a move like this, you have to drop the queen away. Because you have to take the sting out of the move knight b6 check. Which, by the way, is still a very serious idea. But here, black has to play knight b6, a, b, and queen b6. In order to meet rook a7, of course, with queen a7. And then you get this type of position, which is probably a draw by perpetual check. Probably a draw by perpetual check. So, I don't know, queen a2 check and queen f7. I mean, white has perpetual, but not more than that. So here, we probably would not have gone knight b6. We would have gone maybe even knight to d6. And black would probably move the rook. And we would play, you know, maybe b5. Maybe a slower move, like rook a to f1. Just doubling rooks on the f-file and asserting our dominance now over the king side. Clearly, white no longer has a material deficit, right? We have three pawns for the minor piece, which by definition is enough. And not just any pawns, we have a huge pawn phalanx in the center. So clearly we've already overtaken the initiative. So in terms of where our opponent actually went wrong, I think the first serious mistake was not to play c5. And then the second was probably um, was probably bishop c8, actually, because it yielded the c4 square for our knight. And that's what did black in. What should black have done here? Maybe drop the knight back to d7. Maybe start attacking with h5. I would have played h5. I would have played h5 with black. Because even though white gets a5 in, it's actually not such a big deal. Knight back to d7. We probably would have played e5 and maybe gone knight e4. But clearly black is still, I think, in the driver's seat here. And white's attack is not all that clear in this, in this type of position. Maybe c4. But apparently here, bishop e4, queen e4, and knight b8. What a move. Defending c6 and the bishop is trapped. And if white plays b5, bang. I mean, look at just the abundance of tactics in these positions. Can't take because of the fork. Knight d7 to b8 is the only move here, actually, that makes this line work. And it sets up the threat of rook takes d4. Incredible. Incredible. So, of course, neither of us <laughs> have seen even a hundredth of that. But bishop c8 is just too passive because it gives us too many squares. And obviously, fast forwarding, knight b6 check is really pretty, but it, it, it works on simple tactics. If a b, then a b, winning, winning the queen. Or we could even play rook takes f8 check first, believe it or not. 
If knight b6, then rook takes queen. And again, a lot of newer players, I think, would be afraid of this move. Remember that you can always give your queen. It's just like any other piece. Don't treat the queen like it's special. It's just like any other piece. You can give it away for other pieces. You could cash it in and gain a bunch of stuff in return. Now, after queen b6, we played the business-like move. What was the beautiful win? Well, this is a theme that you're already familiar with. Now, it's crucial here to avoid queen a4. This is what I mentioned earlier. You always have to be aware of the safety of your own king. This actually gets checkmated. It's not just perpetual check. It's checkmate on g1. So instead, you can play rook to a8 check. And after king a8, this works very cleanly. All you need is the queen, and it's the similar pattern that we saw uh, earlier. Of course, black can play king b7. Now you play rook takes h8, and this is winning. Again, rook f2, just queen takes f2. Black has no other way to encircle the king. If black's rook could land on g1, then it would be mate, but black's rook has no way of making it even to the first rank. But I didn't even want to bother with that. Given how many blunders I made this game, I just wanted to win just by taking and playing a, b. Uh, knight b6, of course, would have been a little bit more resilient, but uh, we would have played a, a queen a2. Or the Russian schoolboy mode is just to play rook f1 and get rid of black's rook and win the game. So we have a question uh, by Vanua. Wasn't queen b8 instead of rook f8 more resilient for black? Well, queen b8 doesn't work because of rook takes d7, but you're right. The correct move here, as we discussed, would have been to play queen d8 and get out of the pin. Black can also try king to b8 it, so that knight b6 is not a check. The problem here is the knight doesn't only have b6. It can also drop a visit to e5. And, I mean, obviously, here you could probably just play knight takes g4. I mean, as simple as that, just... Take a bunch of pawns. And this is another piece of advice I have, which is that when you've sacrificed a minor piece, a lot of people assume that it's either checkmate or the sacrifice is a failure. Remember that a minor piece is just worth three points. So sometimes the best way to follow up a sacrifice like this is just to win a bunch of pawns. This is exactly what we did here. I think some players would get enamored with the prospect of mate and would start considering this type of move, right? Or maybe queen a4. But no, you have to realize that a piece is just three points. And the simplest is just to start taking a bunch of pawns. Of course, it also helps that this rook participates in the attack. But just because you've sacrificed something big or, or blundered it doesn't mean that you can't garner the equivalent number of pawns later down the line. This isn't the sexiest, but it's going to get the job done. But in terms of the opening, I'm going to do a little bit of work in this line. But our next test when we face this is going to be queen to b3 because this basically forces black to find bishop takes f3. But I, I hope that you enjoyed the analysis. We finally got through a speedrun game, so it's a minor miracle. And we got 3200, so this was a fantastic stream. I'm super pumped. I'm going to go to bed because tomorrow is bullet brawl. Thank you, everybody. Have a great start to your weekend, and uh, I'll see you guys later. Bye.